I guess you can be seated. Dee, are you uh, going to welcome us? <coughs> Let's sit down so she can welcome us. <laughs> As you've noticed, it's a little different. I'm not doing announcements. I'm only doing welcome. So welcome to Roseland. We're glad you're here, and we're glad you're on the Internet with us. There is one correction on the announcements in the back. The sale will not be Saturday and Sunday. It will be Friday and Saturday. So don't plan to buy anything on Sunday. Come to worship. Okay. Okay. That's all I got for welcome. You want me to do the next step? Sure. Okay. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Rise to your feet again. We want to welcome you to this uh, uh, communion service. So please join us in Christ for the world we sing. There's no better cause than to sing for Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 All right. chat so if the kids want to come up you guys are welcome it looks for some of them this is going to be a repeat i think love it so maybe i'll have one of you do the children's chat how's that my job is to train up the next generation who knows maybe one of them's going to be a pastor how are you you are adorable come on up all three of you are adorable you're handsome okay come on come on you can sit right here, okay? Or you can sit right there, either one. Are you ready? Are you ready? You can do it. You can do it. All right, do you guys remember what we talked about at the first service? Not a clue. See, I knew you were a Methodist. Yes. Matthew 6, 33, she remembered the verse. Are you guys ready? You want to, can you say Matthew? Matthew? Yep. Six, six, thirty-three. Yeah, exactly right. Matthew six thirty-three says, "Seek first the kingdom of God." In other words, get to know Jesus, and once you know Jesus, everything else will make more sense. So, Matthew six thirty-three, seek first the kingdom of God, and then, and then everything else will make sense. I've got something here. Do you know what this is? Oh, gosh. Do you know what this is? Toothbrush? Is this a toothbrush? So now, is this how you use a toothbrush? You take out the toothbrush and the toothpaste, and then you put this in your mouth, and you ah, and then you put toothpaste on it and put it in the drawer. Is that how that works? <laughs> <laughs> yep. I love it. Well, no, no. You're supposed to do first things first. You, you're supposed to put the toothpaste on the toothbrush first, and then you brush your teeth so that they're nice and clean. 
you need to wet it for oh you're right probably ought to get a little water on it otherwise that toothpaste is gonna be a little bit dry so you've been there done that you know how it works right how about you have you brushed your teeth not in some years are you serious <laughs> art link letter was right children say the darndest things but anyway so just like there's a right way and not a so good a way to brush your teeth there's a good way and a not so good way to live your life if you put the kingdom of god first then everything else will work better and so i've got this little medallion and it's got the first on the front and the back it says matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of god so you know the apostle paul talks about running the race of life to win the prize and ultimately the prize in life is getting to know god's son jesus christ so seek first the kingdom of god does that make sense thank you for saying that all right <laughs> all right let's pray are you ready to pray can we pray here we go dear god thank you so much for making me first help me make you first amen all right. Thanks again, guys. And you remember the verse. I'm so seriously impressed. Wow. That is awesome. You think that's going to stay? I don't. All right. We'll do it this way. All right. Have fun. Have fun. Unless you want to do the sermon, too. That would be good. You're, you're ready, right? I'm looking to raise up the next generation. <laughs> All right. And now it's pass it on, raising up the next generation. No, it's Jan is going to pray. Lord knows I need prayer. All right. Lord, for children, <laughs> yeah. let us pray. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day to be with each other in your house. May peace and love fill our hearts. Show us the way to light and truth. Help us to be kind and patient. Guard us with your wisdom. Fill us with joy and gratitude. We pray we can share the love of Jesus with all those around us and that the lies and schemes of the enemy will not prevail. We lift the people who don't know you. We pray you will bring people into their lives that can bring truth to their hearts and hope for their souls. Help us to honor you in all our ways. Give us the courage to share your gospel with others. Thank you for your love that never ends. Thank you for the crown of joy that awaits us forever in your kingdom. We pray in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
good the second time. All right, please have a seat. Have a seat. We are so glad that you guys are all here this morning for worship, whether you're in person or online. If you're online, if you're in Albuquerque, good for you. If you're in Sebastian or, you know, uh, come on in. <laughs> um, you know, as we begin today's uh, message, I have some friends. Can you put that slide up for us? Would you please all stand and let's read that verse together. I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, Jew first and also Gentiles. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Please be seated. And as you look at that screen, as for some of you, you know this verse very well. You could probably repeat it with just a couple of prompts or maybe straight from memory. But uh, this is what we're going to be talking about today. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the authentic gospel, not a social gospel, not a hit him in the head with a Bible gospel, but what? Uh, Christ has said about himself, his mission, his purpose, and his plan. So we're going to be talking about that because it's good news. How many of you like good news? Yeah. Don't tell me what your favorite news outlet is because it's got a mixture of good and bad news. It just does. All right, but we're talking about the good news, and on God's channel, it's all good news. Uh, and it's because it's based on the Christ, the Son who accepted the mission of the Trinitarian God who came to be born in the muck of a manger to teach us what it means to truly follow the Father, our God. Uh, he said many times, you've heard it said, but truly I tell you. When he came the first time, he had to correct some of the teachings that have gotten in place over thousands of years. And the Christ, through the Holy Spirit, continues to draw us towards the truth revealed in God's Word. So it is the power of who? But it's at work in who? In us through the Christ and the Holy Spirit. So it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who does what? Oh, wait, 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 wait. That sounds exclusive. Are you saying, if I don't believe, the gospel can't save me? Is it save me? Is that what you're saying? Not all of Christianity agrees with that. I happen to agree with that because it comes from a plain reading of the Bible. There are some that are Unitarian Universalists. They're not so sure about the saving work of the Christ because the truth is, if he's not saving us from sin and ourself, then you don't need a savior, so that kind of puts this whole Jesus story into question. So Unitarian Universalism, we're all good to go. All dogs go where? I hope they do. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be the person your dog thinks you are? <laughs> well, God knows better, and so that's why we have the Christ story, okay? So it is at work. God's grace is at work in this world, saving everyone who does what? Believes. The Jews first, because the Christ came through the Jewish people, but also for the Gentiles. So how many of you are Jewish? How many of you are grafted onto the Jewish root? In other words, you're a Christian Gentile. Nice. See, you can get Methodists to raise their hand in church. You just have to ask the right question. So this good news tells us how God makes us what? Right in his sight, which implies what? You can be wrong in God's sight. No matter if all your family and friends, your entire church, your denomination, the world says you're right, if God says you're wrong, guess what you are? Wrong. <laughs> so this is accomplished from start to finish by what? By what? Faith. It's, I made them in yellow so you couldn't miss it. Okay. All right. There you go. It's like that test where the teacher goes, this is important. So you make a note because you know it's going to be on the test, right? So anyway, uh, it's accomplished from start to finish by faith. Faith in yourself. Faith in your denomination. Faith in who? Jesus Christ and what God has done in Christ. As the scripture says, it's through faith that a righteous person has life. How many of you want to have life? Abundant life now and abundant life forever. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so we're in this series uh, where we're asking basically this question. Whose church? Whose church is this? Roseland Church. Whose church is it? 
It's the church of Jesus Christ. He is the head. We are the body. Some of us function as hands. Some of us function as eyes, ears. Uh, some of you are at knees or at knees or whatever. You know, you know the old joke, right? All my good habits I learned at my mother's knee. All my bad habits I learned at some other joint. <laughs> so whose church is this? This is the church of Jesus Christ. When you say it's my church, you demean the work of the Christ who literally died to give birth to every church. Okay, and, and when you say it belongs to a denomination, you forget that a denomination is nothing more than like-minded Christians who have figured out a way they think honors Christ and lives into his mission, which is to seek and save the lost. That's all denominations are. So whose church is this? It doesn't matter what the label is on the front. It really is the church of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. And last week we looked at um, the sword of the Spirit or the sword of righteousness. And what is that? It's the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. See, you, everything you need to know about Christianity, you learned in vacation Bible school. You just did. Okay? So uh, here's the deal. Uh, there's uh, God, uh, in this series, we're looking at where God has had us in our past, where God has us in this present moment, and it is a transition moment, and where God is leading us as this church becomes a global Methodist church uh, by June 1st. How many of you find that scary good? All right. I'm not going to ask which one is, yeah, because, you know, as we struggle with issues of insurance and, you know, leadership and who's in and who's out, um, yeah, this is scary for me, to be honest with you. I mean, preachers come and go, but this is your church. And my job is to, first and foremost, get you in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Secondly, to get you to understand you have a shared mission together, and it is to seek and save the lost. This church exists for the glory of God and exists with the power of the only one who can save us, and his name is Jesus. All right. So I hope uh, at the end of the series, at the end of the month, you will be able to say with gusto, this is my church, not in a pejorative sense saying I own it, I paid for it. No, 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 no. This is my church, and not in the sense that, well, it's my denomination. No, 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 no. It's this is where God has saved me and God is growing me up. Can I get an amen? That's the kind of church we are and want to be. Um, but, you know, maybe, uh, you know, oh, I love chapels here. I do a morning chapel and an afternoon chapel for our um, preschool kids, and it's great. One of my favorite songs is this. You see, church can be a lot of things to different people. Uh, maybe you know this song. You put your right foot in, you put your right foot out, you put your right foot in, and you shake it all about. You give your heart to Jesus, and you turn your life around. We are heaven bound. Woo! Some of you need another shot at that. Are you ready? All right. Uh, this is calisthenics, not just church. I want your blood to be up so that you can listen to the rest of this message. Are you ready? You put your right foot in. You put your right foot out. You put your right foot in and you shake it all about. You give your heart to Jesus and you turn your life around. We are heaven bound. All right, some of you, I got to worry about your destination. I, you know, <laughs> just present your trip ticket at the door before you leave. Okay, uh, but here's the deal: uh, a lot of times we've got a foot in and one foot out of the church. Uh, for any church to be launched, and this is a relaunch of this church, it's an exciting, scary time, and it requires commitment. So I'd rather see you guys put your whole self in and not take your whole self out. Okay. So it's all about commitment to the cause of Christ in your individual life, the life of your family, your circle of friends, this church, and this community. Can I get an amen? Amen. So the sword of righteousness is how God does that. It's his word. Uh, the Apostle Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, all right, theonoustos, God-breathed, and useful for teaching, correction, and reproof so that we can become that masterpiece that God wants us to be, that the character of Christ will be so evident in us, people will say, wow, I want whatever it is you've got. I hope that you're going to be that kind of person. I hope that you will literally become the light that leads people to the light that lights up each of our past, our path. Um, but here's the deal. It really does hinge on what you think this book is. 
you know. Um, this book is not a collection of lessons on being good. And some of us have been lulled into believing that's what it is. In fact, uh, somebody uh, recently has said, uh, well, I don't really, I don't get into the Old Testament because it's just a collection of stories. Uh, and so I'm thinking, huh, that's 2 Timothy 3.16 verse. All scripture is what? God breathed. Was he talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament? Actually, only the Old. Maybe a couple of letters. Second Timothy was circulated fairly early, so it couldn't be a lot of what you think of as the New Testament. They literally hadn't been written yet. All right, But he's talking about the Old Testament. And so every time Jesus got up to preach, like that first time when he stood up in a synagogue and read Isaiah and said, this day in your hearing, this, this scripture has been fulfilled. So was Jesus preaching the New Testament or the Old Testament? Old Testament. So don't throw away the baby with the bath water. Uh, the Old Testament is not just context for the New Testament. It is one story. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is one story with one hero. What's his name? Jesus Christ. And it also tells us how it's going to work out for each of us, whether you choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or not. And for some of you online, or maybe some of you sitting in here, you go, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, and I want you to think about what you think about, what the gospel truly is. For those of you who think it's a way instead of the way, for those of you who think uh, that there are other ways, then you need to think through. I'm not here to tell you what to believe. I'm here to tell you what the Bible says. What does it say? What does it mean? And then what do you do about it? Does that make sense? So that's called a hermeneutic. Not that you need a $10 term, but there it is. Because what you think and how you think about what the Scripture says will determine what you think God expects from you and from your church. So uh, that word gospel, come on, you scholars, where does it come from? How many know the Greek word? Euangelion. Are you ready? Euangelion. See, my son's name is Leon. It's easy for me to remember. You're angry with Leon, okay? So... <laughs> Euangelion uh, is the same, it means good news. And gospel is just old English, good spell for good news. So euangelion is the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's another word that comes from that root, the Greek word, angelos. Any idea what an angelos is? An angel, an angel. So one is the good news, and then angelos is the one who delivers that good news. So, um, Here's the deal. If you don't believe in angels, you've got a problem with who Jesus talked to, especially, well, especially when he was in being tempted in the wilderness. Uh, if you don't believe that God has a separate created order that does his bidding, uh, not always and not perfectly, certainly the story of Lucifer disagreeing with God and being cast down to earth is something to consider and think about. But here's the deal. So we have this euangelion, the good news, delivered by angelos, the angels, and you just stood up and said, three of you did it on your own, and all of you did it together. You said, I am not ashamed of this euangelion, this good news, this gospel. I am not ashamed. But I'm asking a very serious question. Are you? Are you ashamed of the authentic gospel, not the gospel that some would call the social gospel or other people call the gospel of salvation? Are you ashamed of the totality of what the good news is? really is. You know, in first century, there was no social media. There was no CNN, there was no Fox News, so it didn't matter your political persuasion, although they had them then, Sadducees, Pharisees, and the scribes, it could be either. But news came from a messenger, and good news traveled just as fast as bad news. So a messenger delivered the best news possible to humanity. Do you remember what that news was? Mary, you're going to have a baby. Now, that didn't seem quite like a good news at first, did it? No, no, because her family and friends were going to weigh in. It's going to be a problem. Her betrothed, Joseph, had going to have an opinion. Uh, and so she actually had to uh, grow in this pregnancy with her Aunt Elizabeth because it was a real big problem in a small town. Anybody here from a small town? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know why we put a phone system in Hicksville, Ohio? That's the name. It's not a joke. That's where I grew up, Hicksville, Ohio. Uh, we put a phone system in to verify the rumor mill, okay? Uh, but word traveled fast then, just as it does now. Um, but the message from God through this angel, the messenger of God, was, you're the one. 
When the time was right, the child was born of the Virgin Mary. It wasn't right a moment before, and it wasn't right a moment after. That was the time, the place, and the person that we celebrate as Christmas. But Mary wasn't the only one that received the good news, was she? Do you remember the shepherds on the, uh, the side of the hill there in Bethlehem? Read it with me, would you? The angel said, don't be afraid. How many of you are afraid about the transition we're in? I asked earlier if it's scary good, you know? So fear is not always a bad thing. Fear makes you think before you act, okay, or as you're acting. So don't be afraid. I bring you good news of a great joy for so not just for a few, it's for everyone. But does everyone receive good news? I wish they did. I wish they did. So the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem, the city of David. What do you believe about that story? I mean, is it limited to Courier and Ives Christmas? Or do you believe, in fact, the Holy Spirit hovered over Mary and what was conceived in her was fully God and fully man? You see, that belief will determine what else you can believe about Jesus what you will consider his teachings meant and the authority that they carried. Was he one teacher among many? Was he simply a Mahatma, like Mahatma Gandhi? Was he a great soul? Or was he, in fact, who he died claiming to be? The God of very God. You see, that was what killed him. It wasn't his miracles. It wasn't his teachings. It's according to the high priest who tried him. You, a mere man, claim to be who? God. So are you ashamed of the gospel, the authentic, true story beginning with all the prophecies leading up to Bethlehem and all the teachings of the Christ as he grew in stature with man and with God until he was crucified on Calvary's cross? He was dead and buried, and on the third day he did what? Is that like the story of Tuxapani Phil to you? I mean, or is it, in fact, authentic human history, the turning point of all history. That's what it is to me, and I hope it is for you. This is the good news. You see, there's a difference between good news and good advice. Don't miss this, because this is important. It may be just enough to get you to understand, to turn your faith, what you really believe, and how you order your life around your set of beliefs, it may be just enough to get you to turn it to where the clarity of the gospel can shine through you in a way it never has before. There is a big difference between good news and good advice. Hear it again. There's a big difference between good news and good advice. If you get this, it does have the power to change you. Good news tell you, tells you what has happened. It's past tense. Think about it for a minute. When was the last time you read good news in the future as a headline in the newspaper. Good news is about what's happened that impacts what's going to happen or what is happening right now. Good advice is something you need to do so that something good could happen. Anybody ever give good advice to your children? So what's a piece of good advice you gave to your kids? (laughs) Or something bad will happen. Right, yeah, exactly. I hear you, Gary. I'm with you. I was there. Yeah, I told you about you angry Leon. There you go. Um, Any other good advice? Oh, that's great advice. Leave home now while you still know everything. I love it. Thanks, Gary. There's some wisdom in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't play in the street, right? So, uh, you know, uh, that's not good news if your ball's in the street and, you know, You look both ways. Still, if I ran out in the street, mom would yell at me, but that's a different story. All right, so good advice is something you need to do so so something good could happen in the future. That's a big difference between good advice and good news. Uh, Here's the deal. Some (coughs) Some inside of Christianity have replaced the good news of Christ crucified and raised from the dead with a legalism that says do more and try harder. In other words, if you do this and don't do that, if you try hard enough, then you will succeed as a Christian. You'll succeed as a human being, as a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a worker, or an employer. Uh, do this, try harder, and do more, and you'll succeed. That is not Christianity. Those are outcomes of having a heart aligned with God as revealed in Jesus Christ. But they will not save you. 
an alcoholic or a gossip needs good news more than they need good advice. Think about that for just a second. An alcoholic or a gossip or any other label you want to put on somebody's sin set needs good news more than good advice. Now, they can use good advice, but the truth is, if somebody's told you you've already won the victory, isn't that better than saying, if you try hard, you might finish last? That's the difference between good news and good advice. Philippians 4.13. Read it with me. I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength I need. Hang on just a second. (coughs) Folks, that's good news. It's not good advice. What Jesus has done on the cross, what Jesus has left us in the gospel, what God has set up to be his word from Genesis to Revelation is good news. It's what God has done. It's not a collection of moralistic teachings and you ought and ought not as much as it is a story of one hero from Genesis to Revelation and that hero's name is Jesus. So Christ has defeated Every enemy that you're struggling with right now, hear that again and begin to get the glimmer of hope that the gospel is good news and not just good advice. Christ has defeated every enemy you're struggling with right now. I can do everything, including that thing you know you can't do, with the help of who? Jesus is doing the heavy lifting. And he makes his strength available to who? Those who believe? Or don't believe. Those who believe. It's like a valve, not on God's side, but on our side. God cannot do more than we will allow God to do in our life. Hear that again. God cannot do more than we will allow God to do in our life. To do beyond that, it would be divine rape. It would be his strength. Who who among us can stand against the strength of God? He didn't create us to be rocks saying, I want you here and nowhere else. He created us with free will the ability to think and feel and act, and then to contemplate what we thought and felt and did, and then adjust our future plans accordingly. So I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength I need. Physical strength, financial strength, relational strength, emotional strength, and most of all, spiritual strength. Every other religion, every other religion is based on good advice, not good news. You're not going to find a savior in any other world religion. You are going to find methods, processes that will make you a better human being. Processes that can release you from Maya, the illusion of existence. But you will not find a savior. That's why the good news, the real gospel of Jesus Christ is so powerful because it gives us the strength we must need. Uh, the, The four noble truths of Buddhism will make you a better human being. They will. Uh, The the five pillars of Islam are things you must do to attain enlightenment. They they, they will not save you. Jesus is the good news of salvation. He is. This is the authentic gospel. Um, Read Colossians 1, 6 with me, would you? The same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. How does this good news go out all over the world? Through us. I want the world to know. The Lord of life has come to me. I want to pass it on. Is that just a sentiment? Or is it your marching orders? The gospel, the authentic gospel, is changing lives everywhere. Just as it changed your life the very first day you heard and understood the truth about God's great kindness, which is what? Grace, the word is hesed. The great, unending, loving kindness of God. And it's given to undeserving people like you and me, to sinners. You see, Jesus Christ in his life, death, and resurrection changes the way God looks at you. Think about this. This is important for you to get. You know, if all you get of the gospel message is what I say on Sunday morning, I'm glad whether you're online or in person that you're getting that. But you need to listen to a wide range of Bible teachers. You can listen to all kinds of other advice. That's great. You need financial peace, Dave Ramsey. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, uh, Les and Leslie Perot, uh, uh, great advice to marriage uh, that are struggling or getting started. But the gospel is contained in what book? The Bible. So for crying out loud, for you to become a student of God's word is necessary for you to develop the character of Christ. 
It just is. How can the people find salvation if they have not heard? How can they hear if there's no one to teach? And how can you say there's no one to teach when God has given us this book that contains the wisdom of the ages, men and women who have walked these paths ahead of us? I love this picture. You've got a guy sitting there. He's obviously struggling with something. I don't know. It could be finances. could be a marriage. could be kids. could be a health issue. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But he's read in God's word the gospel, the good news. So the basic rubric when you study God's word is what does it say? Don't pretend it says something else. Don't listen to somebody else that says it says something else. What does it say? Read it for yourself. Get a legitimate translation, not somebody's translation of the translation. And then think about how that applies to your own life. And let the power of the gospel, which is reaching out to everyone, not just someone, but to you and to me, let that power come to life in you. And you'll be like this man in that moment where he is surrendering his thoughts, his feelings, and his life to the authority of God's word. This is how Jesus changes us, each and every one of us. Read it with me, would you? If you confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. But if you're arguing with him, well, this isn't really wrong. You know, that was what they said then, but this is what people are saying now. Have you ever heard the word of God referred to as the timeless truth? It's because he who is beyond time, he who created time, has poured his truth through the lives of flawed human beings just like you and me. So you can read stories where they got it horribly wrong, and you can read stories where they got it horribly right, and then you can read it all through the lens of those words in red, the words of Jesus Christ that says, you have heard it said, but truly I tell you. How do you know what's wrong? You know, uh, in the early days of the United States, uh, the people who worked for the Treasury, uh, the secret agents, were uh, charged with uh, discovering and removing counterfeit currency from circulation. You know how they did that? You think they, they gave them 100, 200 examples of counterfeit currency and said, okay, now you can identify count. No, no, because for every mouse trap you build, they build a smarter mouse. You know that, right? So if you showed them 200, there's going to be 400 next year. All right? So what they did is they constantly exposed them to the genuine deal, right? So they could look at it, they could feel it, they could smell it, and go, this is real money. Does that make sense? So once you know the real thing, once you understand the authentic gospel, it is easy to spot the inauthentic gospels that are out there. How many of you realize that everything that Christians and pseudo-Christians and spiritual bunnies uh, say on the Internet or even on cable TV, how many of you know not all of that's true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I love the one, you know. Uh, you know, send in your hundred dollars, we'll send you a golden eagle. I love the man, you've met him three times, but I just found that heinous, okay? That's what, to me, is like, you know, you got some guy preaching on TV and he says, reach behind the TV set and grab the power cord and feel the power of the Lord searching through your veins. No, 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 no. This is where the power of the Lord will surge through your life. Can I get an amen? Amen. So here's the deal. Let me read that to you again. I highlighted two words. What are the two words? How many of you think God is faithful? Amen. It is his nature, it is character. God cannot go against his nature, his character. And part of that is his justice. So now, most of us realize that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross. And for those of us who confess faith in what he did, that death is meaningful. It literally has removed our sin from us. Most of us understand that, but then we read this verse and we don't understand what the word just really means. If Christ has paid the price for our sins, and he has, then God would not be just if he made us pay for our sins as well. Hear that again, because it's freeing. If God is just, and I believe clearly he is, God would not be just if he had Christ pay for our sins on Calvary's cross and then asked us to pay for those sins as well. That's freeing news. For those of you who are beating yourself up for something you've done in your past, for those of you who are beating yourself up for the addictions, the hurts, habits, and hang-ups that are still messing up your life today, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength I need. Get into Christ. And you'll get out of whatever it is that's wrecking your life, destroying your marriage, ruining your health. 
Put first things first. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will come unto you. Can I get an amen? Listen to me. The Holy Spirit wants to go deep into your soul, into your soul right now, and say to you, you are forgiven. Some of you just don't want to hear it. Some of you have gotten so used to being broken, you don't think there's another way. You need to let the Holy Spirit in this communion service say to you, you are forgiven. Of everything you've ever done that disobeyed God or hurt other people, you are forgiven. You say, yeah, yeah, but not this. If you only knew, God knows. And Jesus died. You are forgiven. I remember a World War II wing commander who came into my office at Pasadena Community Church 25 years ago. He told me, Pastor, I can't sleep. I keep seeing the face of the kids I ordered on bombing missions over Europe that just didn't come home. So he was haunted. And he went on and he said, and I also imagine the faces of the women and children killed in those bombing raids. Pastor, I can't forgive myself. He didn't need good advice. He didn't need melatonin to sleep at night. He needed the good news. You are what? He was, he is, and so are you in Christ. That's what communion is. It's remembering that we are flawed. It remembers that we have a fatal fall called our humanness. But God has given us the prescription, the only one that works. Jesus, who is the Christ. So, so let's carry this out, because that's only half of the good news, honestly. And most Christians think it's all the good news, and it's really not. In fact, I would share that it's not even the best part of the good news. So let's say I get good with God. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I confess my sins, and he washes me white as what? I live in Florida. I think sand, like Clearwater Beach, okay? All right, I'm not a big fan of snow, you know. <laughs> Anyway, I get up in the middle of the night, and I trip and hit my head on the nightstand, killing me instantly as I say, gosh darn it, or something like that. And you know the commandment as well as I do, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, right? That's one of the big ten, right? So if that happened to me, would I be damned? Your worldview makes a difference. Because I've had to untangle some pretty tangled knots in people's lives. Well, my husband didn't go to church. Well, my wife cheated on me. My, my kids haven't talked to me in years. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when Satan practices to deceive. And he diminishes or dilutes grace. Jesus does more than just cleanse us from our confessed sin. I love this image. Burn it into your brain. <laughs> Jesus forgives us and gives us his righteousness. It's his record that God sees, not my record, and he was without sin. It's his record and not your record when God looks at you, as long as you're in Christ. Do, do you love that? I mean, i got to look at this one. That was not big enough. It says God's view is through the, the, the saved sinner is through the cross of Christ. It's his righteousness that God sees. He doesn't see our sin, but our sin is ever before us. So what happens if you step out from behind that cross? God sees your sin. Well, that's not the gospel. Yes, it is. That's why Paul says over and over again, and means in Christ these things are true. But as soon as you think you can live apart from the grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is another way, and that for you there's an exception to the rules, then you step from behind the righteousness of Christ. And that's not a place that you want to stand, trust me. Read it with me, would you? 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. What's him? What's his name? Jesus. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what does that really mean? Here's a story that hopefully will give you an idea. How many of you know what in the show NCIS is? NCIS, right? It's basically a, a detective show, like so many, but it takes place in the Navy, right? So you've got the basic idea, NCIS. In one episode, two Marines are sent to arrest, kind of a derelict Marine. And the truth is, they're being really rough with this guy. And then, as they're manhandling him, his shirt, his blouse opens, 
and they see the Congressional Medal of Honor. And these two Marines step back, and they snap to attention, and they salute him. And they treated him with respect. My friends, that's what the righteousness of Christ does for the believer. In Christ, you are given a righteousness which demands far more respect than the Congressional Medal of Honor ever could. That's the gospel. That's the good news. In Christ, our sins are forgiven and we receive our righteousness. So don't fuss and fight about what if the last thing I do is sin. Stand behind the cross. And I get an amen on that. So why would it be ashamed of that? On either side of the gospel, what is there to be ashamed about? You know, ashamed is feeling guilty or inferior. And because of that, you have a reluctance to share your truth, depending on the situation. It's been 2,000 years. Every person on this planet should not just know the name of Jesus, but be standing behind the cross of Calvary, bathed in his righteousness. So how is it that we're so ashamed? How is it that our truth is no longer the authentic gospel and we're not willing to share that? We'll share bits and pieces. They'll know I'm a good Christian. They'll know I'm a good person because I basically do good things. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I remember a press conference in Jacksonville in which an African-American friend, someone I had regularly met to group together and do a Bible study at uh, Warman's Deli there in Jacksonville, uh, he announced his bid for public office. And I was like, yes! You know, we talked about it, we prayed about it, and he makes his public announcement. And I was one of the few Anglos in the room when he did that announcement at a press conference. And he pointedly ignored me. And I was so embarrassed because he was obviously so ashamed of me. And I love to say that our relationship recovered, but the truth is it didn't. We met a couple more times, but Every time we did, I felt his shame of having the pastor of First Methodist, a historically Dixocrat church, in his camp. And I still love the man. He didn't win his bid for the office, but it wasn't because of that. In Matthew 10, 33, Jesus said this. Read it with me, would you? Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. You say, that's not my Bible. Okay, Thomas Jefferson, put away your scissors. It's in your Bible, unless you cut it out or ignore it in some other way. The Christ has said that if you <laughs> want my relationship to be a relationship only when it's convenient for you, then the truth is we don't have a relationship. You've stepped out from behind the cross. And you are standing on your own, not because he doesn't want to cover your sins, but because you chose to disown him, which means he cannot own you before the Father. Think about that, the weight of that decision. You know, Jesus sent out 12 with his authority to proclaim this message of salvation. People have turned it into all kinds of things. Did they heal? Yes. Did they teach? Yes. But primarily, they talked about who? Jesus. If I, you were to put a percentage on your conversations you've had in the last week, how many of those... Are you a 10%, a 15%, a 50%, a 99%? How many of those conversations were spiritual, specifically Jesus moments? You know, he warned them then and us now that persecution would come, but they must not be afraid, knowing that God loves and would care for them and for us, even if, no, 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 really, especially when we are persecuted for his name's sake. And if yet the name of Christ is never on your lips, why would you ever feel the pressure of that moment? Matthew 28, 19, just to remove all doubt, the Great Commission carries a great cost. It's not a slogan to say in church and then live without the rest of your life. Read it with me, would you? Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. You in this church and those who watch online have heard me say over and over again, it's not the arguments about different sin sets that is destroying and <laughs> disabling the church of Jesus Christ today. It's over the nature and the authority of this word. This is one story from Genesis to Revelation with one hero, Jesus Christ. 
and it reveals the plumb line of God. And when we argue about whether the plumb line is plumb or not, we have missed and forsaken the purpose. You know, to be a Christian is not to just be a Christian on Sunday morning when it feels good. To be a Christian is to be a, a Christian in those conversations. What are the two things you won't talk about at Thanksgiving dinner? Religion and politics. Believe me, I've got a divided family. I just do. You know, I'm not going to say my family's more divided than yours. <laughs> but I am going to say this. That, you know, I still look for opportunities to not be mean or pejorative, but opportunities to say, well, you know, uh, this is how Christ has helped me in decisions like this. I wonder if you understand that sharing the gospel is not optional. A friendship that is hidden when it's inconvenient is no friendship at all. You know that to be true. In Christ, we become a friend of God. And apart from Christ, you are lost in this world. And you go, well, I, that's not my gospel, Jesus, or Jerry. You sound like you're a Baptist. No, but I am a, a teacher and a student of God's word, and that is clearly what's presented. To be apart from Christ, to be standing out from behind the cross of Calvary, is to be standing with your sin before God. Sin cannot be in God's presence. So either you're a friend of God in Jesus Christ, or you're apart from Christ, and you are lost in this world. That is the gospel, the authentic gospel. Romans 1.16, read it again with more understanding. I am not ashamed of the gospel, as you've heard it today, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Then a world that values pluralism over truth, even gospel truth, the actual gospel is condemned, even in Christian circles, as blatant triumphalism. In other words, it's just your truth, Jerry. It's not the truth. It's one way among many ways. And when you try to preach and teach and live into the gospel as it's presented by the gospels, you are judged. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't judge other people's religious beliefs. Don't demean them because they haven't had the historical trail that's brought you to this point in your Christian faith. But don't muzzle the mission of Christ. Go, therefore, and make what? Disciples. And you can't do that if you're muzzled. Intelligent dialogue on faith promotes understanding. You understand them better. Well, explain to me the five pillars. You know, don't you want to know? There's goodness in that. But it's not salvation. Okay? And once you seek to understand, then you've opened the possibility that they will want to understand what you believe. And the truth is, Christianity holds up very well in the free market of intelligent discourse. You don't have to know it all. You just have to know who? Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we're going to celebrate that reality this morning through communion. All right? So you've already done a confession as you came in into this communion service. Uh, but now we're going to focus it on the act that Christ did. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, the Christ, had to come from heaven. He had to correct the teachings, not just of Judaism, but all of the world religions, not just then, but now. You've heard it said, but truly I tell you, the gospel is good news. It's not good advice. Christ has done for us what we desperately need to have done. In Christ, there is salvation. In Christ, there is the abundant life, no matter what struggles you're facing right now. And in Christ, your eternity begins the moment you accept Him as Lord and Savior. And then after the supper was over, He took that second cup. Again, he offered thanks to the Father, and then he handed it to them then and to you now, saying, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood. Sin requires the shedding of blood. Why? Because it, it is a heart issue, a life issue. 
you need to understand the seriousness of uh, what you call a white lie, the seriousness of uh, what you call one of the seven deadlies, and realize that it causes separation between you and God. It took the sacrifice of Christ to once and for all cleanse you from your sin. And your part is only to believe that what Christ did on Calvary's cross is a full and sufficient sacrifice for your sin set and for mine. So he said to them then and to us now, drink from this, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of what? Sins. So Lord, we ask you to pour out your spirit on us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for this hurting world, the world within us and around us, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Father, by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory be yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. And all God's kids said, Amen. So as you take that communion cup uh, that you should have received when you came in, I ask you to uh, open the side that has the little bread in it. And here's the truth. A little hope is enough hope. A little bit of the bread of life, Jesus Christ, is enough for the eternal life and the abundant life. So take and eat and receive the power of God to live in Christ. And the truth is, we don't always live within the power of God. There are moments that we step out from behind that cross. There's moments that we choose to sin. There's moments we enter into sin unwittingly, unknowingly. But it is that righteousness of Christ that God looks at our sin set and says, in Jesus' name, you are forgiven. Communion is a tangible reminder every month, or if you join us on Wednesday morning, every Wednesday, that God knows your sin. Jesus died to take away the sin of, uh, of the weight of your sin and even of of death. So as you drink this cup, remind yourself that in Christ you have all the strength you need to face your hurts, habits, and hang-ups and be victorious. Take and drink. Accept the gift that you have offered us unilaterally through Jesus Christ. We know that the gospel is not Unitarian Universalism. We know that it is the power of salvation for those who believe. So within the sound of my voice in this room online or sometime in the future online, there may be somebody who is still not quite there. They don't quite understand. Father, whatever is blocking them from receiving eternity through Jesus Christ, I ask you to just crumble that barrier. I ask you to soften their heart and their mind to let them truly understand that there is a peace that passes understanding, that if you need to button up everything, you're going to remain naked in this world. So, Father, we accept the cloak of righteousness. We ask for you to forgive us, to redeem us, to restore us, and send us out with this message of salvation. In Jesus' name, and all God's kids said, amen. Would you please stand and join us in singing our closing song?
God who knows you, loves you, knows your pain, knows your shame, knows your potential. And in Jesus Christ, has done everything necessary to unlock that potential and to secure the abundant life and eternal life in one and the same moment. Believe unto salvation. Quit trying to be such a good person that you won't accept your need for a Savior. And then once you accept that, become the person you always hoped you would be. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Have a beautiful week.